welcome guys we're here with uh, dr steven chan on a2 the show dr steven we're we're happy to have you you're clearly a person that has has a, like a lot of experience in life a lot of different stories to share but obviously we have a certain uh, theme that we're revolving around and for today's podcast and today we're going to be talking about the israeli-palestinian conflict and we wanted to gain your opinion as much as possible and as learn from your knowledge on the matter. Delighted and to be with you. Yeah, Very happy to help as best I can. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, doctor, so the main, the main point that's been constantly revolving our, in our minds, me and Ali, is the current war that's being waged in the propaganda field and it's clear to see that whenever i was when i ever watch western media it's always revolving around how the war started as if it only started on the 7th of october and everyone who's who's been following up on the palestinian conflict on the on how they've been trying to survive this can say that it's not that it didn't start there it started way before we all know the truth we have all seen the history so i wanted to gain your knowledge on how basically how this propaganda war is being played and how can we change maybe the conceptualization in the western media of, on this topic well the conceptualization is already changing although it took quite a some time into the conflict for this to start happening. I think that the Israeli yeah. reaction is now widely seen, even in Western quarters, as disproportionate. In other words, rather than simply an eye for an eye, but it's 10 eyes for an eye. And the fact that so many of the victims who are being caught up in the conflict are completely innocent civilians, many, many children, people in hospitals, people in schools, all of that has had a major effect on Western perception. Now, having said that, the West is still very, very much focused, as you rightly say, on October the 7th, and doesn't really have a full appreciation of the long background behind this conflict. Part of that is because of a yeah. very, very strong Israeli lobby in Western capitals. They're very, very well organized and very, very able in terms of getting their message across. And if we're going to speak very, very honestly about this, the Palestinian narrative, whether it comes from Fatah or whether it comes from Hamas, just has not been articulated with the same skill. So skillfulness in presenting narrative, even skill in presenting what you think is a just narrative, that takes a very great deal of preparation, takes a very great deal of experience, and I regret to say that the Palestinians have just not been able to mobilize that kind of technical and media skill necessary over many years to put their case forward. I think that a lot of this is very much to be laid at the door, not just of individuals, but overall, I have to say, of the lackluster performance of Fatah as a whole, the Palestinian Authority, and not getting across any part of the Palestinian message. So its rivalry, in fact, with Hamas gets in the way of them even trying to present some kind of objective narrative over the Gaza issue. So even though the Israelis have gone into Gaza militarily on more than one occasion in the past and caused a very great deal of suffering, very great deal of destruction, there's been no real mobilization of opinion on the part of the Palestinians for the sake of Gaza. Hamas doesn't have the skill to do this. Fatah won't do it. And as I say, the Western media has long been captured by very, very skillful narrative spinning on the part of the Israeli lobby. Yeah, I completely agree with that. They, they definitely have better resources to combat this, this narrative. 
especially if anything that comes from the Palestinian side, it's easily shut down. But we're seeing a bit of a change in the trend, like you were saying. And I think it has to do mainly with how social media is playing a very strong role in that, sen in that sense, especially with all of the, the Palestinian people on the ground, the victims themselves, constantly posting stories and sharing their narrative individually as a collect and then all of these stories being shared together as a collective i think that is the main push that is changing the western perception of what's going on i think that is absolutely the case but i think that even more than that because people are wary about accepting any narrative that might be biased one way or the other but the narratives of medical workers, people who are working on the front line in terms of helping people who are suffering, mm -hmm. their narratives about just how terrible the suffering is, about the lack of medicines, the lack of facilities, I think more than anything else that's turned the opinion of so many people in the world has been the attack on hospitals. This is against all the laws mm -hmm. of war. It's against all of the basic laws of decency that the most helpless and literally helpless because many of these people can't move uh, that to attack them or to threaten them that has gained a very great deal of reaction in the west and the whole question of proportionality focuses on why should you attack the most helpless even if you are going to have as it were a reprisal a gigantic reprisal a gigantic revenge attack even though it's completely disproportionate there are some people who should simply be left out of this equation. So to a certain extent, what you have is not only social media telling alternative, necessary alternative narratives, you have also the Israelis themselves overplaying their hand. And this overplaying of their hand has been a very, very great resource in putting forward an open space in which the Palestinian narrative can finally begin to be heard. Mm. It's very true. And it's, not, it's important to highlight the attacks on the hospitals because the Israeli, the Israeli government has mainly been saying they're attacking these targets due to the, the presence of Hamas. And I kind of wanted to go more, delve more into the topic of Hamas as a terrorist group. So the western the western side has labeled hamas as a terrorist uh, party a terrorist group and i kind of wanted to question the legitimacy of that in a sense are they actually a terrorist group or are they a resistance force should we change the label that is being used against them or is it the correct term even a resistance group has got to be consonant of the laws of war and the limits so that you have justice leading up to war. This is a very, very long known distinction. You've got just cause. I don't think too many people would try to argue down the just cause of the Palestinians. But then you have just conduct, how you conduct your opposition to oppression. And if you yourself are basically not obeying limits, if you're attacking innocent people, is that attacking of innocence that basically allows the Israelis to build the October 7 narrative? So there's a difference between just cause and just conduct in war. Now, how you get resistance and rebellion into a just framework is much easier said than done. And this thing was always a powder keg waiting to explode. And of course, explode it yeah. did. And it has to be said there is fault on both sides. Now, having said that, it's absolutely the case that long years of oppression, occupation, basically holding Gaza prisoner, a whole small city state prisoner blockaded, all of that has been very, very much part of the just cause for why you want to rebel, why you want to resist. It's that background story which has not been played out very, very well in Western media. And as I said, part of that is because the narrative has not been well presented, either by Hamas or by Fatah, or indeed by many of the sympathizers of the Palestinian cause around the world. 
this is where the left in general has got to basically learn some lessons. You can't actually educate people by sound bites. And you have got to go beyond sound bites into narrative. And the narrative has got to be pitched in such a way that is simultaneously complex and detailed, but presented simply. Now, again, this is easy to say, but it's a big, big conundrum. How do you make something that is complex, which has a long history, which goes against received yeah. wisdom, how do you present this in a compelling way that is able to be understood? Now, this is where basically Hamas, Fata, have got to get expert people. Now, I put a lot of blame on Fata in the first instance uh, because they're meant to represent all of the Palestinian people, whether they like Hamas or not. They're meant to be the representative. I have to say, it's very, very hard to come across a lazier, more inept government in any part of the world. I've seen them work up close. I've worked in Palestine. I've worked on the West Bank. I've lived there for periods of time. This is inept administration and certainly biased. Biased, of course, against the Israelis, but they do nothing that is able to deter the Israelis from their chosen policy. They're biased also against fellow Palestinians fellow Palestinians in Gaza. The first thing that's required here is not a blame game. That's easy to do, and certainly there is a blame game. The first thing that needs to be done here is for some Palestinian unity. That's going to be a long time coming, and Palestinian unity that's able to command expert resources. We live in a grown-up world. No one takes prisoners these days. I use that figuratively, although that's also been used literally, you've got to be able to play media. You've got to be able to build a narrative, present a narrative in a modern way. This is not a world for children. This has to be done expertly, professionally, in an adult researched way. And that's not being done. So certainly I blame the Israelis. You can't basically blame someone else and say you're completely free of blame yourself. The Palestinian yeah. cause has got to be presented more compellingly. That's very true. But does it, I, but at the same time, uh, Professor, I, I don't think the Palestinians are, giving the, are given the opportunity, like not specifically the government, not Fatah and Hamas, but maybe individuals, they're not given the opportunity to present the narrative, as we can see with the killings of all the journalists um, in Gaza, whenever they speak up or are trying to present the narrative and share it with the world, they end up getting assassinated or blown up or and they're getting targeted, as we can see. Yes, they're being targeted along, I think, deliberately with medical workers and people of that sort. Uh, and almost every major news organization that's tried to embed themselves in Gaza to cover the war up close have suffered casualties. Al Jazeera, for instance, BBC crews have taken very, very close misses. So everyone is at risk in trying to cover the conflict. But because they are there, the coverage is getting better. And of course, the coverage, particularly Western media, is focusing on the humanitarian scale of what is going on there, the human cost of mm -hmm. what is going on there. They don't have to say a word about who's to blame. All they have to do is to portray people suffering, particularly innocent people suffering. And I think the news media, even the Western news media, has been quite good at doing that. I think that the way that the BBC has covered it, for instance, along with organizations like Al Jazeera, has been in a slow way, and of course frustratingly slow, very, very helpful in turning the narrative around, not just in this public presentation, but how the narrative is played out inside people's heads. So a testimony from reporters yeah. that are trusted by British people, for instance, all of that lends a lot of weight to the fact that something very, very bad is going on. It's very true. And I've, I'd see like a lot of this pattern constantly happening in, in general around the Arab world where the governments are not 
they're not do, uh, doing a good job at presenting a proper narrative of whatever their situation is. And then the people are having to take up the mantle and the responsibility on their own shoulders by uniting into small pocket communities to share their story. And, I, and that's what's currently happening in, in Gaza. But why is this a constant trend that's happening across the Middle East as well? It's happening not just in the Middle East, it's happening in many parts of the world. I do a lot of work in Africa, for instance, mm -hmm. and certainly have a replica of that kind of discouragement of understanding. Uh, basically, the government seeking to have a mon monopoly of the narrative. That happens all over Latin America, Africa, the Middle East. But what you also have, of course, are power structures in the Middle East. You've got countries that don't even pretend to be democratic. At least many African countries go through the pretense of elections and democratic practice. <laughs> Some succeed. Yeah. Many, like Zimbabwe, for instance, have given up trying to appear, appear plausible. But when you have basically feudal systems, and that's why most of the Middle East remains feudal countries, where you have absolute command and absolute power located in a very, very small section of the population. Uh, what you have is citizens having no choice but to use social media to put across points of view, which would otherwise simply not be put forward by governments. Now, what this has done, however, the current conflict is to put, at least on hold, if not actually in jeopardy, lots of warming relations between certain New Eastern countries and Israel. Saudi Arabia, for instance, was moving towards what they politely called normalization of relations, that is diplomatic exchanges, that's definitely not going to happen now. So in the face of real politique, what you have is humanitarian politics superseding the real politique, the power politics, and we're gaining a lot of currency in the Middle East and understood by powerful people. These things go hand in hand, of course. Let's take a bit of a back seat now. A lot of that is because, as I said, of the overplay of the Israeli hand, but also the sheer heroism of the Gaza people. What they've had to endure, what they've put up with, all of these things are noted. When you have a humanitarian disaster, what you have is not just the disaster. You have the heroism of those who've got to go through the disaster. When people around the world see that, they are genuinely moved to start rethinking their preconceptions. Mm -hmm. Ali, would you like yeah. to uh, ask a question? Um, I love hearing about um, all of this, Professor. Um, I'm just curious as, so what looks like the way forward? I mean, how was it done before, you know, in all these African countries, you know, like Rwanda or South Africa or, you know, many different countries have had people who live close to one another, but hate each other so much, you know, uh, I'm trying to see a way forward because, you know, me and Saeed, we're Lebanese, we, we're from Lebanon, um, and, you know, Israel's our neighbor right now, so I want to I wanna be able to feel at peace in my home Lebanon, you know, so how do well, we move forward think, uh, Do you here? have contrary forces at work on Lebanon? You have the internal divisions mm -hmm. within Lebanon itself, of course, the religious mm -hmm. differences. And the constitutionally, all the major religions have got to be represented. That's no way to run a government, of course. It's a very strange quota system, but it keeps the peace, yes. provides some kind of stability. <laughs> but in terms of Lebanon, you've got external forces as well, of which Israel is only one. You've got the influence of Syria, mm -hmm. for instance, which is not mm -hmm. always positive. Because Syria, of course, has got geopolitical regional interests of its own and would not wish Israel to get an advantage in a country like Lebanon. So you have all of these power plays that affect the smaller countries caught in between. But unity and going forward on a democratic basis is possible. I lived in Zambia for some years in Africa. Now, look, there are 72 different ethnic groups in Zambia. 72 different languages. They regard themselves as different kinds of people. That's in addition to the small white population from colonial times 
and also an Asian population, people who were taken out there as indentured labor, for instance. And yet what you had underneath wise leadership is one Zambia, one nation, as they call it. All of these groups are Zambians, uh, they're democratic. They go forward in free elections in which governments can change. So it's not impossible. It can be hard, but you've got to want this and you've got to do away with hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, when it comes to the question of Israel, the last election, when it comes to the question of Palestine, the last elections that were held there some years ago, Hamas won those parliamentary elections. This was not acceptable to Fatah. This was not acceptable to the Americans. So basically, by force of arms, democracy was overthrown. And Gaza was basically confined. Hamas was basically confined to the Gaza Strip. But if there had been genuine democracy, then Hamas would be part of government, if not the government. And they might have grown into a very different kind of organization with the responsibilities mm -hmm. of government. Mm -hmm. So when you try to interfere with the will of the people, you basically ask for trouble. So then the question here is, was Hamas the non-democratic party? No. They contested the elections as a democratic party. They were expecting a democratic result to be honored. Who were the ones who dishonored that result? It was Fatah and it was the Americans. So you practice democracy, then you repudiate it, and then you call people terrorists because you've cut off their ability to express themselves as a governmental voice. Well, these are some of the ironies, some of the hypocrisies, and some of the contradictions of international politics. And you've got all of these forces going into the equation in Gaza, where at the end of the day, almost no one emerges blame free. There's been a very, very dirty history just as right now, mm -hmm. the war is a very, very dirty war. I've seen very, very few wars where there's been such blatant disregard for human life. I was in Istanbul just two weeks ago, speaking at the Istanbul Security Conference. This is a regional meeting of largely defense personnel. A number of generals were there, for instance. These were all people who were battle-hardened. They weren't desk generals. They'd actually seen war. They've actually been in the thick of war. And when you talk to them, uh, these military men, they're just horrified. I found they were horrified by the scale of innocent human lives being lost, of so much destruction without seemingly any humanitarian care. And now for a hardened military person, not just one, but the several I talked to, people with stars on their shoulders, you know, generals, full generals, for them to be horrified by what's going on there, that kind of thing permeates into society at large. You know, it is horrific. This has to be stressed. At the same time, there's been certain acts of international assistance, and I really want to point out, because I know the people involved, the Qataris, their mediation, mm -hmm. their help to Hamas over many, many years. They've actually funded the Hamas government to all intents and purposes because they feel that it's better to have a responsible organization called Hamas than someone, something that is not able to be acting in a responsible fashion. But their mediation, they're working with them, using their diplomacy, using their diplomatic skills to try to forge some kind of even temporary ceasefire, get some kind of hostage exchange up and running. If we come to the territory of ceasefire again, which we might because of international pressure, but the ones doing the hard negotiation about the detailing of that ceasefire will again be the Qataris. They're the ones who've kept the diplomatic mm -hmm. contacts open. And they're the ones who basically are going to be doing the hard donkey work. And as I say, I know some of the people involved in this hard work, they won't have slept very much over the past few weeks. Now, they're still going to be mm -hmm. there in their good offices. So sometimes what you see in all of this are very, very positive elements. Now, in this case, when I'm talking about a positive elements to do with diplomacy, if more states in the world were prepared to use diplomatic means, and by that I mean not just ordinary diplomatic means, but go out of their way with extraordinary diplomatic means, 
and most countries in the world have not been prepared to put out for the Palestinians. They've not been prepared to put out for those in Gaza. Putting out, making an effort, is what is required of the international community at the highest level right now. Finally, you're getting some signs of action from the United Nations, for instance, not from the Security Council, but from the General Assembly. And then the big question you've got to ask is what took them so long? You know, where was the mobilizing force among nations that wanted to take some kind of lead to put an end or to at least reduce the terrible suffering that's going on in Gaza right now? And there was no international leadership. So the whole international community needs to look to itself. Why did it take so long? Why was there no leadership on an obvious humanitarian issue? It doesn't matter what side you take, people are suffering. Why was there no leadership on this question of suffering? When this is all over, and I do hope sooner rather than later is all over, there are going to be many, many questions to be asked within Palestine itself, between America and Israel, between the Middle East and Israel, in the United Nations and in the international community as a whole. We are all going to emerge with a lot of blame on our shoulders. Well, wow, doctor, because you can bring those lives back. I mean, I think um, a lot of the narrative that really bothers me is the um, like blatantly racist narrative that if you ask an Israeli why there's a siege on Gaza, they'll say that because they're all very violent and they need to be controlled, they can't control themselves. And the same thing with the checkpoints in the West Bank. Um, there's this narrative that, you know, Palestinians and Arabs in general are <laughs> less civilized, you know, you can say. Um, and I disagree with that completely coming from Lebanon and um, meeting tons of bright, you know, young people that are so bright, but they're just held in by their government. Um, you know, you worked in Africa, so I'm sure you must have understood there's always some kind of racial hypocrisy, you know, or undertones. How do you dispel and move past that? No, I understand exactly what you're saying. I mean, I taught for a semester at Bezet University in um, Bezet, just uh, up the road from Ramallah on the West Bank. Mm -hmm. I taught a master's course in uh, diplomacy. I have to say, they were some of the brightest master's students I've had anywhere in the world. You know, I take up a lot of visiting professorships in many, many countries around the world. It was nothing but a great pleasure teaching at master's level in Bezat University to a largely female group of students who, of course, run double disadvantages, not only being, as it were, Palestinians, but also in a society which still has very traditional conservatisms. So for young women to fight their way forward on an equal basis is difficult. But I asked them, you look, you're going to have a master's degree soon. What are you going to do after you graduate? You know, what am I teaching you for? What are your ambitions? Uh, these are young people about 22, 23. Uh, they said, look, uh, Stephen, we're not staying. We can't stay. Between the occupation and the corruption of our own administration, there's no future for us here at all. We're all going to the Gulf. It's not perfect there. The Gulf states are far from perfect. Some are better than others. I've got my own bias towards Qatar, of course. But they said it's the only place where we're going to have some opportunity. There's nothing for us here. Now, this is a brain drain. It's a youth drain. It's a school drain. Mm -hmm. but they've got no hope because they've got no faith in their own people. And certainly a lot of realization that the Israelis are not going to be letting up anytime soon. So a lot of depression, a lot of negativity is not defeatism. It's different from being defeatist. You're going to go down fighting. You're not just going to accept defeat like that. But what happens is you don't think you're going to win. Now, that's a key variable. You won't accept defeat. You'll fight. But you don't think you're going to win. It's that kind of attitude that can only be changed by a righteous, dynamic, forward-looking, technocratic Palestinian 
government. I think we're a thousand light years away from that right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Professor, you mentioned negotiations pushed by the Qatari side. And I wanted to understand a bit more how these negotiations, like what are the procedures that are implemented and how are they going to push for, if not a ceasefire, maybe another pause or like a humanitarian pause like they did like a month ago? Basically, the Qataris are the middlemen, or in fact, one of their lead negotiations is a female, the middle people in all of this. But the Qataris are not a powerful country in the sense they've got no military muscle. They've got no real power structure they can put out into the international relations of the world. Basically, the ceasefire will come when there's enough public opinion in America to force President Biden to put some American muscle behind what the Qataris are trying to do. The Iranians can't be seen to be doing this because, of course, that involves a separate argument uh, that leads to all kinds of complications. It has to be the Americans basically saying enough is enough. Now, they're starting to make very, very tentative noises about this, but it's so tentative, it's almost shameful. You know, please stop killing so many civilians. You know, what kind of superpower rhetoric is that? So when mm -hmm. the Americans understand that this is going to be counterproductive to their own interests, you know, their ally in Israel is no longer going to have any efficacy because everyone finds what they've been doing so distasteful and awful, then if they put muscle behind what the Qataris are doing, then there'll be a ceasefire. Now, that's only the start of a whole lot of negotiations to come, which will be very, very difficult, far more difficult than obtaining a ceasefire. Who runs Gaza? The Americans had this completely cockeyed idea that Fatah should be brought in to run Gaza. Fatah is hated there because it's recognized as mm -hmm. an inept authority. Should the Israelis be a government of occupation? Well, that wouldn't work. That would be very distasteful. That could be resisted. There would be urban guerrilla warfare for the entire duration of any attempted occupation. Should it be a United Nations government? Well, the United Nations probably don't have the skill to run a small city-state like Gaza. Who would do it? There's not a lot of skill running loose in the United Nations. So you have real problems as to what would happen afterwards. And quite apart from who runs it, who rebuilds it, you know, the place has very largely uh, been affected by destruction. Not all of it is down, but you know, a huge amount, looking at the aerial photographs, has been destroyed or in one way or another mm -hmm. damaged. So who rebuilds it so there's an infrastructure that works? And what we at my institution, the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, we've just issued uh, a statement lamenting the fact that the Israeli attack on Gaza and whether or not they did this deliberately and targeted deliberately, but every single university in Gaza has been destroyed. Everyone. They've all gone down. Now look, this is an attack on the future generation. It's an attack on the possibility of, quote unquote, a reasonable educated government emerging in Gaza. So what you have is such short-sightedness such refusal to even allow the possibility of the Gazans to run themselves in an educated, technocratic way. Just wipe out Hamas. No one thinks about the next day. No one thinks about, as it were, encouraging Hamas to be a more responsible government. That's only possible if there are genuine discussions and negotiations with the Israelis, of course, as to a just future, not just for Gaza, but for the entire region. And so you have real problems here. There's not going to be, in any foreseeable future, a two-state solution for the simple reason that a state has got control, sovereign control over its own land. The Israelis want land, so they're resisting a two-state solution with its sovereign overtones. If there were a two-state mm -hmm. solution, you could have 
one of the states in two parts, Gaza and the West Bank. It begs all kinds of questions that have yet to be answered, most of all by the Palestinians themselves, which is why I say there has to be some unity forged at some point soon among the Palestinians. Even a younger generation coming to power within Fatah, if you looked at the average age of the leadership of Fatah, these are gerontocrats, which is a fancy word for saying tired old men. Mm -hmm. No old women, <laughs> no, young, no young men, no young women, no new ideas, nothing. It is yeah. completely a disaster in terms of the future. So no wonder my students were saying, look, Stephen, we're going to the Gulf. There's absolutely nothing for us here. Now, when I say there are brilliant students, I mean that the top third of them would probably have gotten distinction, master's degrees in... Great Britain, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, they would have made it. Yeah. They would have made it very, very well. That's a lot of talent, a lot of expertise, a lot of youthful energy uh, going out of the country, going north. So a very, very great deal of the future has already been mortgaged away. So even if there is some kind of agreed long-term ceasefire, agreement at least in long-term negotiations as to the steps that must be taken for what comes next. So many things are up in the air. And if so many people are staying away, they've taken their resources, they've taken their expertise, they've taken their knowledge, they've taken their youth away with them. And the question you've got to ask is, would it take 100 years from now before there is a settled Palestine? It may take another century. All of us talking here, all of us listening to this program may be dead before something just is finally able to be brought into being. And I mean, that's, I guess that's a, a bitter pill to swallow at this moment too, because <laughs> we all, obviously we all want a solution to happen now in our time we want to see it ourselves we want to see the peace with our own eyes and the fact that it might not happen in our in our generation or maybe even the next generation we don't know it's it's tough to accept but you may have a peace of sorts you may have a ceasefire but that doesn't mean that you're going to create a palestine that is able to be prosperous that is able to have long-term futures but in a constant state of tension as to whether or not the ceasefire will break or not. It might be that kind of peace, yeah. an easy peace. Maybe a phony war, as they say, both sides remain armed and ready to go. But that itself doesn't help the future. So we do have, well, so, I do have a less than positive view. And I've been working on this issue for quite some time. I've been involved for quite a long time. And I've listened to the narratives of both sides, including the Israeli side at a very, very high level. I'm going to try to understand where they're coming from. I disagree with the way they perceive and the way they broadcast where they're coming from. They've had a terrible history as well, and we've got to recognize that. It's not all propaganda. It's true. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they've got to understand that other people are going through terrible times at their hands. And it's that understanding, it's that acceptance of, responsibility, which also needs to be educated into the Israeli consciousness. But they're being constantly given a narrative where it's impossible for them to accept that kind of responsibility, aided and abetted, of course, by the terrible history that they suffered at the hand of European superpowers during the Second World War. Yeah, they were almost exterminated by the technologically most advanced country in Europe, and it was. That's why it took so many Allied forces to defeat Germany. It was an advance of everyone else. And that this ruthless genocidal policy towards Jewish people, well, that scars. It scars an entire nation for some time. And there are still survivors of the death camps. You know, that generation is not yet dead. So it's going to take the Jewish people, another generation at least, to move on from that. At the same time, any efforts to get them to accept a wider narrative, 
that just because they're victims once does not mean they can make victims of whomever they wish to victimize. Getting that twin track narrative into Jewish and Israeli discourse. So very, very brave intellectuals in Israel are trying to do that. But they also need to have a united Middle Eastern support base that says, look, we understand, but it's got to start with we understand, but then, but. And the way you then go into the discourse of but, how skillfully you do that, which will make all the difference, perhaps, for the future of the Middle East. So when it comes to a long-term solution, doctor, what, what are we aiming for? What exactly are the steps that we should be taking? Or well, I'll work for the ceasefire or, first. Like whether the people or the governments. Well, in terms of changing the governments, if the Israelis could get their act together in terms of their government, I mean, it's coalition government after coalition government, all of them unstable, mm -hmm. most of them led by Netanyahu, but yeah. obviously often with very, very contrary, contrary forces within those coalitions. Doves, as well as very, very right wing parties are involved in this government. Getting the Israelis to agree on a common narrative as to what is needed is key. Getting the Palestinians to agree on a common narrative for unity in the country is key. Getting them to agree that what is above all needed is technocratic leadership. At the height of the Arab Spring, I was invited to a private conference of the ministers of higher education from the Middle East and North Africa, all Islamic countries. Uh, I can't name names, obviously, this is a private uh, diplomatic conference. But I was seated next to a very, very senior Middle Eastern minister of higher education who gave a brilliant paper. You know, you, at these conferences, you've got to say what's going on in your sector, in your country. He gave a brilliant depiction of higher education in his country. All the figure work was there, all the extrapolations forward with their graduate career destinations. All of that was basically itemized for the audience. But I congratulated him when he came to sit down beside me. Then the Palestinian minister got up to give his presentation. And everyone, now, apart from me, everyone in this room is a minister, okay? I'm this guest speaker. Everyone in this room holds ministerial responsibility. The Palestinian minister gets up and everyone begins laughing. And I turned to the minister, uh, who the seated beside me, who just given this brilliant performance. And I said, why? Why? And he said, look, wait, Stephen. He's got nothing to say. Nothing. You won't have prepared anything. You kindly congratulated me on my preparation. Yes, put a lot of work into that. He won't have. He's here for the ride. He'll say inanities. He doesn't do anything back home. He's just a playboy. He's there because of nepotism. He's not a minister like everyone else in this room. And we work at our portfolio, some more successfully than others. We just listen. And he was completely right. This is an opinion by one of his peers who actually took his job seriously. The Palestinian did not take his job seriously. So when I went to Berzette University later to teach there, and I asked my students, what about your Minister of Higher Education? And they said to me point blank, look, Stephen, we as students just voted for the Student Representative Council here at the university. We voted Hamas. We don't support Hamas, not at all. We voted Hamas as a protest vote against him the minister from Fatah. Now, when you've got that refusal to take leadership properly, when you've got that complete disregard for technocratic leadership, look, you're asking for trouble. That's all I can say. You know, everyone I've come across in the Fatah administration, quite a few, without exception, cannot be taken seriously as ministerial material. It's very interesting to hear. Like, I don't know it was at, at that level of corruption, nepotism, and complete disregard for the their actual, the power that they have in their hands, you know, the, the responsibility that is within their roles as 
politicians, uh, leaders, complete disregard for it. And it also makes sense why they're not respected and they're amongst their peers because they just don't, they're irresponsible. And it's kind of, sh it's pretty shameful that, that we, that this is, this is how they're regarded, especially when their people are being massacred. What advice would you give to their leadership? What to the Palestinian leadership? What, well, they could, what is they, they could resign and make way for a younger generation. They get some youth in it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It's nothing like old men pretending. That's to a be good young. point. That's a good point. But you know, there needs to be a change, a generational change, and then a paradigmatic change of how you undertake government. And it has to be a commitment to technocratic ways forward. Um, you take a tiny country in the Baltic area of Europe, Estonia, it used to be a Soviet satellite. It's very small, it's bloody cold in the winter. But they're the most wired up country on earth. Everything is transacted with visibility online. Every government decision, every government debate, even of the smallest subcommittee, has the record of that meeting posted online. Provided you want to take the trouble to do it, and many citizens do, you can interrogate every single step the government is taking in every single sector. Now, Palestine yeah. is in fact very, very small. You know, one of the great tragedies of the region is that both the Israelis and the Palestinians are fighting for a tiny piece of real estate. I mean, the first time you go there, you're appalled at just how small the place actually is. So it's, it shouldn't be too difficult to wire up the country so that citizens can absolutely be involved in the government of the place, be at least aware of what's going on in the government of the place leave no room for corruption and nepotism, or at least much less room than there is now. Taking major steps forward of that sort makes for a better future. It makes for citizen involvement. It makes for accountability. It certainly makes for transparency. That's a paradigm step forward, which I guarantee no one in Fata has ever even begun to think of. Young people think along those lines. That's what's needed. It's, they're just, just not adept at social media. If they can work stuff, apart from just TikTok mm -hmm. and Facebook or <laughs> you know, Twitter or whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever you know, they can do stuff. They can actually transact things online. And by that, I mean not just simple business transactions. You know, the skills of transacting government are very, very much now electronically based as well as face-to-face -face based. That kind of leap forward into the future. There are other things as well. Should there ever be something like a two-state solution or some greater degree of autonomy, there's also got to come with some greater control of resources. For instance, the Israelis control all water resources right now into Palestine. This allows them to hold Palestine to hostage if need be. But then something simple. How do you get into Palestine? I've got two choices. I've either got to go across the Allenby Bridge from Jordan, which takes all day long, or I fly into Ben Gurion in Tel Aviv and take the overland. And sometimes the Israelis are not minded to let me in. The only way I get in is on diplomatic papers, which I'm kindly furnished with. There's no airport in Palestine. There was an airport. It was bulldozed by the Israelis precisely so that there could be no independent entry and exit from Palestine. In other words, yeah. it's not just Gaza that's a prison. To a certain extent, the whole West Bank has got prison-like qualities. Why can't I fly into Palestine? You know, and that's something which has been deliberately prevented. So taking infrastructural steps of a simple nature, build a bloody airport. You know, it's not rocket science to build an airport. And let people come 
and go. Those are simple technical transactions in the international community, which the international community could facilitate if it wanted to. So mobilizing that kind of agreement around specific projects to free up space, space of entering and exiting, take one sector at a time, build one technical sector at a time, let them snowball. That would be the way I would approach the future, apart from wiring up the place and having a younger generation in charge of the place and then getting serious unity talks going between the West Bankers and the Gazans. So, you know, a number of simple steps that are very complex in themselves. And much depends on the Palestinians. They've got to want to do this. I sometimes worry they've gotten into a default situation thinking, oh, well, is us, no one likes us, we'll be downtrodden forever. Mm-hmm. Well, there may be some truth in that. There's not total truth in that. Technical plans to go forward can certainly be put forward. And I would very, very much include technical plans as one of my starting points. And those are some great points, Dr. Steven. Like, I really hope that whoever is listening to this and is capable of making change takes heed to that advice. My, the final question that I would, I would like to go into is the Zionist agenda has multiple points that I've been, I've been hearing rumors about, stories about, and of for, for this specific attack on, on Gaza. One of the points that I was hearing about is the plan to make the Ben Gurion Strait where they wanted to cut through the uh, like the valleys between Jordan and Gaza to to the towards the ocean and so that they can have their own strip of land for their for like naval passages plus they also wanted access more access to the sea for the offshore oil and um, which currently are connected to the Gaza strip so I don't know what exactly, if the, what truth there is to these uh, rumors, to these stories, and what exactly is the, Z- the Zionist agenda for Palestine, for the region as a whole. And you said you've, re- you've seen the perspective of the Israeli people and the Israeli government. So maybe you can shed some light on this point. These are hard ones. These are all questions that basically age into speculation as to what might be possible yeah. in the future. Desirably, the best possible case scenario is if there's some regional cooperation. It's only possible in a region that's at peace and prepared to cooperate. And yes, in that kind of condition where Israel and Palestine are at peace, I see no reason why there shouldn't be regional cooperation, even involving the two of them, even involving all kinds of resource issues like offshore oil, other and sorry sorry to interrupt, London. Professor, but um, uh, uh, for the regional peace thing, I feel like they are pushing for that with the Gulf countries. They're pushing for the Gulf countries, but you've got to also involve the central players or those who should be the central players on location. So the Gulf, of course, yeah. is very, very skillful at things like oil exploration, oil drilling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They have a lot of expertise mm-hmm. to share, in fact the best in the world at some of these aspects and technical, um, as it were, uh, ways of going forward. So this has to be shared with the region, Israel, at peace, with Palestine. The Palestinians have got to be able, however, to share in this kind of technical exploration at the same level. I'm not aware of too many high-ranking petroleum scientists, for instance, in Mm-hmm. Now, I don't want to do them down. At Bezette University, as I found, superb engineering departments. Whether or not those engineering graduates see themselves as having a bright future in the region, or whether they too, like my female students, are going out elsewhere, attracting and retaining a bedrock of expertise who can participate in regional cooperation is key. It's no good saying, let's have regional cooperation if you've got no one on your side who can actually carry the flag for you. Mm-hmm. 
not a political fanatic, able to do the hard technical work, the donkey work. That kind of thing, I think, is key. Now, I would say this, wouldn't I? I'm an educationist. I work in universities. I believe in this kind of thing. You know, I take an academic salary, which I assure you is not very large, so I can continue doing this kind of thing. But I believe in the future of young people who are qualified to do things that my generation couldn't do. And Palestine has got to take that step and believe in its young people. I yeah. totally agree, Dr. 100%. Stephen. Um, my last question I want to ask you quickly, is there other things than a two-state solution that are being offered as a solution to this conflict? Um, I hear two-state solution is the, the most popular one, but is there a way that it can be a one-state solution where um, they're all living together and working together like it well, was? One would like, the late Edward Said basically came to that conclusion at the end of his life that it would never be a two-state solution, it was just a dream, and that basically there should be one state with everyone having equal rights. What you have, mm -hmm. however, is an Israeli fear of being one day outnumbered by the Palestinians. That's not the case right now, but the Israeli academic Uri Abelov wrote a paper about the existential dread of the Palestinians is no longer being the majority in their own homeland. This dream of homeland was very, very large in the formation of Israel. And in fact, the Balfour Declaration that the British, as it were, penned and exchanged notes on this in the Reform Club in London, the Balfour Declaration referred to what is now the state as a homeland. So the discourse on homeland it's very much revolving around Jewish people as the majority population. If there's one state with both Palestinians and Jewish people, you've got to get over that rhetoric of our homeland. It's got to be everybody's homeland. Mm -hmm. Now, that would take an awful lot of work to convince Israeli people to do that. This has been their whole quest ever since the terrible war, World War II. But also it's been their quest since 70 AD you know, when the Roman armies ransacked Jerusalem after the Jewish rebellion way back just a few years after Christ. And the era of the wandering Jew began, which continued until the formation of the state of Israel. They never had a homeland. So built into the entire ethos of Jewishness, being a Jew, is the fact that we've at last got a homeland. Now, to share that is a big, big ask in this very, very short space of history. So psychologically, the only viable way forward is a two-state solution. Each mm -hmm. has its own, but achieving that has got huge obstacles. The settler question and the land they've acquired being only one of those and all kinds of issues to do with, as I say, resource share, water share, transport links, all of these things, property rights, who gets to keep what, who gets to employ whom, underneath what terms, etc., etc. Just to address all of those issues, even if you had political agreement on the broad framework of the two-state solution, the technical detail would take years of hard negotiation to settle. And although I myself quite enjoy being involved in negotiations, that one is far too tough for me. I wouldn't want to be mm -hmm. part of that. That would be a very, very thorny set of issues indeed for very good reason. So it would be an agreement that would be the start of a process. And that process would have to be a complicated one going on for some years. I think still in the round, the two-state solution is a way forward because I really can't see the two peoples now with such antagonistic recent histories settling down and living together. If they can mm -hmm. live in their own states, then what you have is a condition of international law which governs relationships between two states. And international law accords equality to all states. That's a major first step, equality of identity 
when you're in Israel, they look down on Palestinians. There's no equality of identity. It's probably much easier to start with equality of identity as states. And states having the legal personality of equal entities gradually can filter down to individual people as being equal citizens of a complex region. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you were saying, Ali? I was just saying thank you for that answer. Yeah, that was a very thorough answer. Yeah, it was. And uh, I think uh, that has been our time, Dr. Steven. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and sharing your your insights and your knowledge. It's, it's definitely, it's more than uh, what I knew. Learned quite a bit more than uh, mm -hmm. than I already knew. And uh, it's something that to look forward to and to share with others as well. I really hope everyone who's watching was able to take a take a l larger image of what of then increase their perception of current events and what's going on and i mean the only thing we can do right now is i guess be positive and hope for the change that you suggested and look towards the youth that maybe they can create something different and maybe in the west as well the youth in the west can change the thoughts and the complete senselessness that's happening in the, in the governments in the West. Um, thank you again for your time. We really appreciate it. And if you have any final words, please. Thank you for inviting me. And I wish you the very best of seasonal greetings. And don't forget, once upon a time, there was a lot of hope coming out of Bethlehem, at least. And we hope mm -hmm. that at least some of those hopes, <laughs> no matter what your religious persuasion is, some of those good hopes for goodwill and peace in the world among all people. Let's hope we have a Christmas where some of that can be realized. So thank you very much for having me. And thank you. Thank Guys, you. Th this has been another episode on A to the Show. Thank you for watching. You know how we sign out. <laughs>